What's going on guys? Tyler here and it's another Saturday Q&A with me and you. And so I got some good questions today. And if you guys have any questions, uh, drop them on Facebook, respond to any of the emails we send you. We're trying to compile a list of questions so I can get a lot more videos just like this done for you. So I can help you guys out. I wanna get you the best results possible with CT50, all right? Let's get, let's get started, let's dig right in. It's Saturday and I had a couple people actually answer this, ask this question. It was, uh, it was basically, I'm having a hard time transitioning from rows to the jumping pull-up. A lot of people did these jumping pull-ups where you jump up, chin over the bar, and you come down slowly, right? They did these jumping pull-ups to negatives and their biceps got wickedly sore and they couldn't do anything for several days. Now, first of all, let me, let me tell you that that's, that's kind of normal your first time ever doing jumping pull-ups to negatives. Because when you're doing a negative, you can actually resist about 30% more than when you're actually doing the positive portion of the movement. Um, and this, what this causes is, is kind of a, a greater degree of muscle breakdown. And so that's why you're so sore after doing a lot of negatives like that. And so with things like the rows, one of the things I notice about people when they do a body row on the rings or uh, on, a, on a Smith machine or in a power rack or in any situation, a TRX, um, what they do is they always do their body rows where their, their body is at a big angle like this. And they'll do their body weight rows and they'll get to the point where they can do a couple sets of maybe 10 or so. And they're like, oh, I'm ready for the jumping pull up to negative. When in reality, you should try to get your body from a 45 degree position down to a, about a 10 or a 20 degree position before moving on to the negatives. That way you actually build the strength. So what you do is you basically start high if you're a total beginner and over time, you just walk your feet a little bit more forward, a little bit more forward, a little bit more forward until your body's about 20 degrees. And when it's about 20 degrees and you can still pull the rings or pull the bar all the way to your chest for several sets of maybe six to 10 reps, then you've built enough strength to be able to handle the jumping pull up to negative. But if you, if you go from a 45 degree angle and you're doing these little tiny rows that are real easy and then you go to a jumping pull up to negative and you're falling down real fast like that, you're gonna tear your muscles down fast and it's gonna hurt for several days, okay? And I don't want any of you guys to get injured, so uh, that's why I'm breaking this down for you um, as best I can. So another thing to think about with the jumping pull up to negative is treat it as a strength exercise. The purpose of this exercise is to teach you stability in the top position and stability in the bottom position. So if you're coming down and you go like this and you get to 90 degrees and you go bah, and your arm snaps out like that, um, that's a sign you're not ready for that exercise yet. And so what you can do is only come down as low as you have control. So you might jump your chin over the bar, come down to here and you feel yourself start to fall, you put something underneath you, you're, you're, you're low enough to the ground, you can extend your legs and just stop there and repeat through that range of motion. And gradually over time, you'll have full control of the bottom position. I never want anybody doing a jumping pull up to negative where they lose tension at the bottom, where they lose the ability to keep their shoulder packed down inside the socket at the bottom. If you're coming down and your shoulder's going bloop, like this and coming out, rather than staying down inside the socket, then you, you're, you're gonna do less dam or more damage and less good, okay? So that's kind of my strategy. Make sure the row really gets to that big angle. If you get to that big angle, or I guess it's a small angle, 20 degree angle, as close to parallel to the ground as possible, make sure you're there before you start doing the jumping pull-ups to negative, okay? And then with the jumping pull-ups to negative, reduce the range of motion to only what you can control and focus on strength building, not so much on just crushing it with tons of reps and whatnot, okay? Take your time with it. It's a skill building exercise that you can progress to level three, four, and five. All right, let's get on to the next question. You've sent out a ton of emails about finishers in the last couple months. I didn't get any of these finisher programs. Why are so many people talking about workout finishers? What are they? Can they help me in my program? Okay, so uh, I met Mike Whitfield probably uh, almost two years ago now. I think it was about two years ago when me and him first met up. And he had this seed planted in his head called workout finishers. And it was a good idea. When people have a good idea, it, it flourishes. And people follow people who have a good idea, right? I had an idea about progressive movement training, progressive movement technology, about a system like P90X, but had five different levels, like five different P90Xs in one. And you're watching this video because of that system. So I had a good idea and I created it and I manifested it into this world. And Mike has done the same thing with workout finishers. And essentially what a workout finisher really is, it's not some fancy thing that Mike invented. Of course, he, he coined the term and, um, and then really, really owned it, really made a brand out of it. Uh, it's essentially a, uh, 
uh, say three to 10 minute super short workout that you would add at the end of any workout to increase your metabolism and get better results from that workout. Now, is this necessary? No, a workout finisher is not necessary. You don't need workout finishers to get great results. Um, it's, it's not something that you have to go out and buy. I don't, I don't recommend everybody buy it, but it's fun and it's something cool to add on to the end of your workout if you want a little extra kick in the pants. I especially like the very short ones, the uh, three to five minute workout finishers. Because you could go out there and you could do a CT50 style workout and then you could rest for five minutes and during that five minutes, you're recovering and stuff. And they say, okay, you know, I'm gonna do one of the uh, 50 uh, workout finishers that Mike has in his, his regular program or one of the 50 ab finishers he has in his regular program. It's just, a, it's just a way to add a little bit more fun into your workout. But if you look at the science behind what he's trying to do, essentially what people do is they work out, they either break down muscle or they start to burn body fat, right? Let's say you do a CT50 workout where all those free fatty acids are gonna be floating around your bloodstream post your CT50 workout. So generally I recommend people just stay active after their workout, but another way to do that is to take a five to 10 minute break and then do a finisher. And then you burn off a bunch of those free fatty acids instead of allowing them to transport around your body and then redeposit on a different area. So it's a cool way. It's definitely a cool way uh, to add something at the end of your workouts um, to get a <laughs> Sorry about that, my camera just died, battery pack died, and I didn't wanna waste some good content that I was just talking about. So basically with the workout finishers, it's a great thing to add at the end of your program. It's a really fun way to, uh, to boost your results. And it's cool because there's a bunch of them and you can do a bunch of different types and varieties and stuff after you work out. But is it necessary? Not really. If you guys wanna check it out, I'll post a link below to the ab finishers and the workout finishers program from Mikey. All right, um, let's go to the last question. We got one more on my list right here. Oh, this is a great one. I'm really happy that they asked me this one. So pay attention to this one. Pull out a pen and paper because you're gonna wanna use this information. All right, the holidays are coming and I'm noticing that lots of people are getting sick. What do I do to prevent getting sick? Or if I get sick, what can I do to heal faster? All right, I got a secret remedy that I use with uh, some people, people who ask me who I genuinely believe will actually do it. So since they asked this question, I'm going to answer it in a way that I answer with all of my private clients and my close friends and family. And I have a secret formula for for uh, reducing the chance of getting sick if you're around sick people, or if you start to feel that little tickle in your throat or that boogery in your nose, then do this for anywhere between three to seven days and you'll watch that disappear so fast, all right? This is my cold formula. So you're gonna go to like Whole Foods or a natural health food store, you can go online and search this stuff out and order it, but you're gonna wanna get some sort of bioavailable vitamin C, okay? So uh, there's a company called Health Force Nutritionals that makes a really good vitamin C that I've used before. There's a fruit called Camu Camu, C-A-M-U-C-A-M-U, -C -A -M -U, that is a really, really, really bioavailable source of vitamin C that you can use as well. But the idea is you wanna get a lot of this stuff because you're gonna be using a lot of this stuff. So, so bioavailable vitamin C basically means you don't wanna just have like a sorbic acid. You wanna have a food, ingredient, or a food source of vitamin C that's powdered down in some way, okay? Bioavailable vitamin C. The next is a tincture, a, a alcohol or liquid tincture of elderberry, liquid elderberry, right? Liquid elderberry is extremely high in antioxidants and I'll explain how you can combine this with the vitamin C in a sec because I got one more ingredient, which is echinacea. We've probably all heard that echinacea is uh, great for immune system support. So again, a tincture, you wanna use the droppers of this as well. Now, those are the three most researched immune support agents on the planet, vitamin C, elderberry, Echinacea. Those three things have been proven. Uh, different scientific studies, I've proven it in myself, all my clients. Those three things definitely boost your immune system. So here's what you do. You take several scoops of the vitamin C. I try to make it equal out to a minimum of 10 grams of vitamin C. If I'm really trying to prevent anybody from getting sick, it's gonna be 30 grams of vitamin C. Now, don't worry about uh, too much vitamin C. They've given this stuff intravenously to cancer patients up to hundreds of grams of vitamin C per day and they're totally fine, okay? So I, I wouldn't worry about that too much unless you have some strange reaction to uh, the food that you're, the fruit that's providing that vitamin C. So don't worry about that so much. So 10 to 30 grams of vitamin C. So whatever you bought, make sure that equals that. Could be a lot, don't worry, it could be a lot. Mix that in with 64 ounces of water. So get yourself a big giant shaker or a big giant water bottle, mix that in with 64 ounces of water. Now you're gonna take half of a one ounce container of elderberry and half 
of a one ounce container of echinacea. And you're gonna pour that in there, half of it, which is gonna be like 15 servings of each. You're gonna shake that bad boy up, let it sit, shake it up, because you wanna make sure the vitamin C um, declumps a little bit so you don't drink in chunks. It actually tastes pretty good. It actually tastes pretty good when it's all mixed down. So shake it up a bunch, right? And then uh, you're gonna wanna start with about a quarter cup of that, see how your stomach feels, make sure it feels fine. After about a half hour, start slugging that stuff throughout the day. So that, that concoction will make you about uh, one to one and a half days worth of a drink. So you don't wanna just chug it down, you wanna sip it throughout the day all day long so you constantly have those nutrients entering your body, all right? And you're gonna wanna repeat this until all of your symptoms go away and you feel good again. And generally speaking, that's gonna be, like I said, uh, if you're more of like a flu, it's gonna be about three days. If you're more of like a cold, maybe five days. I would go a maximum of about a week. And don't come emailing me and be like, whoa, the formula you just told me is expensive. Because yeah, it's gonna cost you a couple bucks. And I'm not selling these supplements. I'm not trying to be, a, be an affiliate for these supplements. I don't have any uh, way to, to make any money off of this. This is what I personally do with myself, my family, my clients, my, cl my friends. Um, so try it out. Bioavailable vitamin C, 10 to 30 grams half of an ounce of liquid elderberry, half of an ounce of liquid echinacea. Make sure those are single ingredient concoctions, not these fancy things that have a bunch of concoctions in there. And uh, pour those into a 64 ounce water bottle, shake it up until it's all mixed together nicely and sip on that. You do that when your family's sick around you, you're not gonna get sick. You do that when you start to feel sick, you're gonna, get, you're gonna heal up so much faster, all right? So give it a shot. Hope you guys enjoyed today's Saturday Q&A video. If you guys have any questions at all you want me to include in the next edition of Saturday Q&A, post them in the comments below. I'm gonna add them to my list and they're gonna be up there next week. I wanna help you guys get the best results possible with your workouts, with your nutrition, with your lifestyle. So anything goes, put the questions below. I really do appreciate you guys asking them. Otherwise, hope you enjoyed it. Happy Saturday to you.